Is traditional dog training failing our pets? What if there was a better way, one that taps into the emotional connection we have with our dogs? In this episode, I'm joined by Angie Winters, author of Don't Train Your Dog, as we explore why typical training methods might be causing more harm than good, and how we can become better dog parents instead of just trainers. Tune in to discover the keys to raising a happier, well-behaved dog by meeting their emotional needs and teaching them the right way without tricks. Stay tuned. You're listening to Starlight Pet Talk, a podcast for pet parents who want the best pet care advice from cat experts, dog trainers, veterinarians, and other top pet professionals who will help you live your very best life with your pets. Welcome to Starlight Pet Talk. I'm your host, Amy Castro. My guest today is Angie Winters, author of Don't Train Your Dog. For Angie, helping dogs is more than just a job, it's a calling. As a dog parenting coach and social entrepreneur for more than 20 years, Angie has obsessively studied, raised, and rehabilitated over a 1,000 dogs and helped their parents. Her record for fixing broken dogs who were deemed unfixable by typical dog trainers, vets, medications, behavior experts, and even their own parents and sometimes rescues is unparalleled. Using a careful understanding of dog emotion and effective communication, Angie's cutting-edge dog parenting philosophy helps dog parents, rescues, and prison dog training programs nationwide. Angie has had dog parents drive from as far as California to seek out coaching at her Ohio home. Her mission is to create a world where dogs are understood and valued for their incredible gifts, leading to happier and healthier lives for both dogs and their parents. So Angie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So it's interesting that we're doing this topic because I just recently did an episode with Jennifer Holland, who wrote a book called Dog Smart, Life-Changing Lessons in Canine Intelligence. And it really got me to thinking about the many ways that our dogs are intelligent, but how many of those ways are very different in how humans measure intelligence. And I think that kind of tied over into certainly some of the things that you talked about in your book and the way that we quote unquote train dogs versus what I see it more as creating a relationship, establishing boundaries. So you had said in the book that you had, you feel like society kind of misunderstands or basically underestimates the emotional complexity of dogs. So what do you think are some of the misconceptions that people have? Yeah, I think they vastly underestimate the intelligence and the emotional entanglement that they are born with with humans. So when people have a dog and anybody who's had a relationship with a dog, they know how close they are. They know that their dog, you know, already knows what they're going to do and can can establish these routines and and sometimes learns a routine in, in one repetition, depending on the outcome, you know, or what they get, any kind of positive result, they learn that immediately, right? But it's a positive result from the interaction between the human and the dog. So dogs are born reading our facial features and they're able to understand them. They're born with it. They don't learn this. You know, studies show they're born with it, which means they've kind of accepted us into their life, into their DNA. If they're born that way to look to humans and to pair with humans, basically I say they're born to be family members with us because of this entanglement that they're born with and this dependency on us to be able to read our eye movements and finger pointing and say, you know, to locate objects and to, you know, navigate the modern world. So the problem is people are focused on this dog training mentality that we've all been raised with and taught. And, you know, it's just on and on and on. I think people see constantly where that falls short, but yet we always just default back to that type of of thinking of training a wild or domesticated animal. And you're trying to put this on a super highly emotional, intellectual being that's a family member. And then you're just trying to use these, bring it all the way down to the simpleton, you know, food in equals reaction out or fear in equals reaction out. When really the effective communication is already there. It's just that dogs know how to use it. People don't know how to use that in order to guide their dogs into learning the proper family skills and safety rules and to fulfill them. Yeah, I loved it in the book when you were talking about the fact that many of the things that we consider training are are basically just like teaching them tricks. And one of the examples you gave was, you know, you tell them to sit, you give them a treat. And it's like, it got, it just got me to thinking like that. You're right. That's really no different than telling them to sit up and beg or telling them to twirl in a circle or play dead. You're, you're giving a verbal, you're giving a reward and they're doing 
you know, and they're reacting, but, you know, how does that translate into them not getting run over in the street when you want them to listen to you? And I, and one of the hangups I always had with treat training is if, if it's so dependent on the, and I know that there is a place to use treats, but it's like, if that's the only way that you can get your dog to do anything, then what happens when you don't have treats on you when you're out and about? I mean, it's just like, that's always been a question in my mind for people who rely on those. You're going to carry around a pocket full of treats everywhere you go for the rest, you know, for 14 years. Just doesn't make sense. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and treats for me are, they're just the enrichment of the things that I'm already teaching them. It's the icing on the cake of things and, you know, a way to go out of my way, catch them already making good choices and, and having good behaviors and, and to reward for that and encourage those states of mind and those actions um, and those feelings. But they do not do anything. I, I don't care. I don't care how anybody, how anybody paints it. Everybody knows that you, you can help a dog that's a little bit unsure of an object or something that's just unsure of. Treats can help make them feel better about that, but they cannot undo fears. They cannot absolutely prevent fears. That's done by the relationship between the dog and the parent. And that trust and respect has to be there. But the dog training mentality in the dog training world, because it doesn't work, has tied parents' hands and parents are just like immobilized. They can't figure out what to do. So half the time they don't do anything or then they just lash out in anger because they've their, t- their hands have been tied. And they're just left with this. Well, it should work. Well, then there's something wrong with your dog. Well, then you didn't do enough repetitions. You didn't give the right treats at the right time at the what. And the reason why, um, and then everything goes off the rails. And then parents truly believe there's something is wrong with the dog or something's wrong with them. And they're just not up up to it. So, and I'm saying that these are parents who have given it effort. I mean, they give the effort. They, they want to do it. But if you have the wrong information, it's not going to ever work anyway, but it's made it seem like it's so hard to concentrate with or to, to communicate with a dog. It's so hard to teach them not to bite kids and not to run out the door. And it's really not that hard at all. Right. Well, and I think a lot of it seems like you're kind of working with the natural, like some of the things that you talk about in the book, the example of training a puppy to only play with its own toys and the process, you know, I don't want to give away the farm by, by, by sharing too much, but it's a process that you establish from the beginning. It's not something that you wait until there's a problem that they've eaten the legs off your furniture and they've been chewing all your stuff up for whatever months that now you're going to fix that with training. It's establishing parameters parameters just like you would with your with your own children. I mean, you don't train your children per se. You like and and, ex- and I think the example that you give in the book, you know, is is great. Really got my mind changed about the idea of pet parenting cuz because per- to be perfectly honest, I have a little bit of a hang up with how far sometimes people take this concept of pet parenting and I want to get into talking about the humanization of dogs and how that kind of does them a disservice. I do want to talk with you about that, but but I do like that where you talked about like what is your definition of parenting? Can you explain that a little bit and how that translates not only to your to your children but how that translates to your other family members including your pets? Right. So I think that the reason why I had the same feelings of you as you years ago, but like, as it explains in my book, I've been doing this for 28 years. So it's been an evolution, right? But it's, it's, you know, the first main learning, learning phases happened in like the first five years, seven years. And then it was just refining to try to come up with these simple ways to use recipes and simple ways to, to guide dogs. So that became more solidified for me. And I felt perfectly fine calling it parenting because I realized that parenting was a more accurate description of what I was doing with these dogs when I was just bringing in dog after dog. And as I, as we've talked about, I was just, you know, getting only taking dogs into my house and, and over and over and over of the ones that nobody else was able to fix. Right. And in this, just this attempt to find solutions that I was just watching all these dogs suffer and lose their home. And, and, and I could see the, the lack of common sense and this dog training mentality of treats, 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 sit, or fear, you know, in um, neither one of those works. And so just a desperate attempt to find answers, I I started bringing them in. And then as this process went on of me bringing them in and raising two kids at the same time, I realized, wait a minute, the only problem I have with calling parenting is when you use the word, this is my, this is my um, child was first of all, they don't need to be a child in order to deserve parenting. Right. Just the fact that they're born entangled with us and they're dependent on us in our modern society means they deserve they are a family member in my mind and they do deserve to be parented. They don't 
need to be a child um, in order to deserve that. But what people mistake that with is when they say this dog training doesn't work. And so they just kind of give up and say, I'm just going to, he's my child. I'm just going to let him do whatever he wants because he's my baby. It's like, well, we don't, we don't let our child do everything we want anyway, because they're our baby either. You know, they deserve to learn and dogs deserve to learn the family rules and safety rules and to be able to function and, and not be anxiety ridden um, just as much as children do because they're family members. But so I am parenting these these dogs, I realize, because my definition of parenting is providing love, support, and guidance to vulnerable family members. Now, children are vulnerable and they're two and three and they grow up and they're you know no longer that vulnerable anymore. So they don't need that kind of parenting that dogs in our modern society remain perpetually two-year-olds. They're going to always need the guidance. So that's why I call it parenting and why I feel comfortable with calling it parenting. And in fact, it's actually more accurate. And also I realized if you get out of that dog training mentality, that's how you start realizing, oh, and they're like, oh, this just seems like magic. That just worked too easy. It can't be that easy. It's like, well, it is when you have certain skills with children, you know, this kind of thing. We know that this generally works with kids. This generally works with dogs. There is that commonality. So there's room for temperament. There's room for breed. There's room for all that. But there's still a common amount of guidance that works that dogs understand. Right. So it's got to be black and white, which is different. It's, the timing of it's different. How you parent and give that guidance to dogs is very different than you give it to kids. Agreed. Agreed. But I think there's also, you know, there's some of the things that you were talking about, like providing calm, consistent leadership and, you know, not going to extremes of emotions one way or the other. I think that's the same with kids. I mean, I think kids can become immune to, well, you know, well, first of all, negatively impacted, but also very immune to extremes in emotion or inconsistency. And then the next thing you know, they're running their own agenda. Cause I mean, I was like that even, you know, as a, going into my teenage years because my mom would say, well, you're not going to leave this house. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And I would leave yeah. and nothing ever happened. So right. don't, don't throw down that gauntlet, but it's the same thing. I, I see this a lot with people parenting their pets and their children. I mean, you see it in the grocery store, you see it in the restaurants, the, the threatening over and over and over again, we're going to get up and leave this restaurant if you don't do this. And we say it 50,000 times, like, how about we say yeah. it once? Mm -hmm. And then we make it happen. Right. And therefore, right. ta-da, you know, the kid right. will quickly learn. And it's the same. You gave the same or similar examples with with dogs as well. I mean, do you see that as a huge issue with uh, with people working with their dogs is the inconsistency? I do. There's too many human words. I had to learn to not use so many words with dogs in my attempts to figure out what works with them. And then they taught me that that works, you know, facial expressions, which we talk about in the book as a, just a parenting across the board for, for kids and dogs, say it once and then make it happen. And so the, where people trip up on that is they don't have a clear plan of actually how they're going to give that guidance. Right. So human parents, if they have the knowledge, you know, say, here's what I'm going to do. I already think out the scenario. Here's what's going to happen. It's going to be natural consequences. You remain emotionally neutral when you do it. Not that, I mean, parenting is parenting. Sometimes we're going to lose our temper a little or whatever, but if you have a plan and you have the actual tools in your toolbox that actually work and that you can do, and you're confident about, then you can remain emotionally neutral when you're doing that. You have no chance of remaining emotionally neutral, which renders all your words and your everything ineffective if you cannot remain emotionally neutral. And so that's why my book goes into even all the way into see the picture of this look on this person's face. I love the I love the pictures in the infographics in the, in the oh, yeah, book. Yeah, because yeah, it's got to be easy. It doesn't matter if you or I can do it. it the, I, the, you know, parent, if parents can't do it, then dogs are going to continue to lose their homes. You know, mm -hmm. dogs are going to continue to be in danger. Kids are going to be in danger. The shelters can't take anymore, right? It, the shelters, it doesn't work. There's only a few that get rescued. And even then, the amount, as you know, the time, effort, and money, and the resources it takes to rescue one dog, and then when people don't have the ability to rehabilitate that dog, then they place it in. And when adoptions happen, many times they're unsuccessful. And then they come back and the dog has more problems now, has more separation anxiety. Now it's labeled a biter. All that stuff is the reason why I wrote the book, because all that can be easily prevented and the behavior problems can be fixed. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's surprising to me 
well, and maybe it shouldn't be the things that people do that create the issues that they've they've got. You know, you give examples of the play biting with your puppy and roughhousing with their face and encouraging them to do that. And it's like it's all fun and games when they well, it's maybe not so much fun and games because those baby teeth are pretty sharp. But, you know, when they're little and they don't have the bite power, but then when they're bigger and they still want to play the same way, now you've got a problem with it. And it's like it's I think it's completely unfair to the animal that it, and, and we've talked about this in several episodes. We talked about it in uh an episode where we talked with somebody who was uh, who worked with people that were going to have a baby and how do we you know get the dog ready for the baby and the way you get the dog ready for the baby is you decide how your life is going to be and and you mentioned it many times you just mentioned it now and many times in the book it's you don't just go into it whatever it might be the exercise or the practice or the scenario you plan for it and so it's like if I know I'm going to not allow my dog to go into my baby's room. When before the baby's even here, why do we even let the dog go into the room or to go upstairs? Like create those boundaries early. We don't want the dog jumping on the baby on the couch or grandma when she comes to visit. Well, why do we let them do it all the other times? Like it's, it's you know, there's only so much anybody can handle switching of the rules at a whim that they can't comprehend, you know? No, no. I mean, for dogs, you know, there just need to be consistency. But the great thing about dogs is, you know, they're capable of such dramatic change, given a trusted, respected parental figure um, and this guidance. They're they're capable of incredible change, fa- way faster than any human being can change, you know, because they live in the moment. And as long as that trust there and as long as their environment makes sense to them, according to the natural wiring that they're born with, which, you know, it's the way Mother Nature works. As long as you can replicate that in your house and in your parenting, dogs learn fast. But further, even beyond what you're saying, my goal is to empower parents with every recipe and every prescription that they need and and the the perspective that they need and all the tools they need to be able to have the dog be present with family members and be have good behavior, have easy behavior, know when to be easy, know when to be calm, because they're born wanting to be included so badly, right? And so, so much of this typical dog training has failed and it's really... It's really so sad because then the dog gets chaotically removed from the room or when people come over or whatever, you know, and then they're they're shoved into the crate, which makes the crate horrible. Uh, You know, they're just and they become heartbroken and anxiety ridden and they completely don't understand. They deserve to be able to be taught in a way they understand proper behavior that's that's safe and, and effective so that they can be included. I mean, they deserve to be taught in a way that they understand. And they, the way that they understand is not typical dog training made up by humans. These words put onto dogs. Yeah. I, I love in the book when you talk about the, the three different ways that dogs tend to see people. And I think that's another thing that kind of correlates with human children too, right? So they either fear you, they basically blow you off, or they respect you. And I see that, you know, you see that all the time. So you can be the aggressor and, and, and create that fear, or you can be, which I see probably even, well, it's interesting because you don't see the aggressor as much because I don't think people are as bad about that in public, but you do see that permissive side of things of letting, you know, basically letting them get away with murder. And, and it's rare that you see that, see that respect, I guess, because it has to be earned. Can you, Talk, talk a little more about that. Yeah. And so dogs are, like I said, it's so much simpler with dogs and the dog training world, typical dog training world has made it, made it seem like it's hard to earn the dog's trust and respect. So they do need to respect you, but they also need to trust you. So those things are equally important. So you can only get that by providing dogs firm guidance, but it's supportive guidance at the same time. So, you know, I draw the analogy between the three different types of parentings that psychologists have determined for many years. So it's like a way to explain. You've got to hit that firm but supportive parenting so that you're you're not to be feared and you're not to be dismissed. You know, you are respected, but because you give respect back and you're treated in a way that, you know, honors, you know, what they're born with and you educate yourself in a way that communicate with them in a way that they understand And then it's like almost everybody I know until they do this firm but supportive parenting and they approach it in the way that my book, Don't Train Your Dog, talks about is that your relationship becomes so close and involved with this dog that you see its full personality that most people are never seeing their dog's full personality. They're just seeing all these actions and reactions and fears and the love is there. You know, the love is we're we're just we're just entangled with dogs. I mean, dogs are 
our family. We're entangled with them. I, I don't see how that can be disputed at this point based on what we know about them. And they're capable of learning extremely high level thinking because of that attachment to us, right? So, and because they're partners with us. So that has enabled them to function at a much higher level than they probably would if they're just as self as an, as an animal, you know? So I don't think they're simply domesticated animals because they're born entangled with us. So I think they deserve to be treated as family members, but to be for people to learn the guidance that they need to function in our modern society and be fulfilled and happy. And so that every family member is safe. You know, we, we, we teach children to how to interact with each other so that they can be safe and we can walk out of the room without, you know, the child hitting the other child over the head with a steel truck. You know, it's like we, we, we do, we, we approach that. We, we give the proper guidance consequences if needed, what will happen? We know we don't allow this. We can't do this. Here's a better way. You know, that's supportive guidance. Still firm. I'm never going to allow the hitting, right? That's the firm part. But the supportive part is here's what we can do different. Here's what's going to happen if we don't. Here's what we do with different. So it's providing a teaching moment. It's not providing punishment. Punishment is not learning. It's not a learning moment, providing punishment. Punishment is something that's done to kids or dogs after something has occurred in the hopes that 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 will be, you know, so harsh or negative that they will never want to repeat it. It doesn't truly teach them why we're doing this and why it can't be and what the alternatives are. You know, it's it's interesting because I as you're saying that, so my real job, <laughs> I shouldn't say real job, but the thing I actually get paid for, to, paid to do in life is I uh, I do communication training. And one of the things that I really focus on, and I'm actually starting a second podcast called Unapologetically Assertive, because people confuse assertive with aggression, like, you know, that it's that it's something to be feared, right? And to me, assertiveness is, you know, finding that balance of, of getting along and getting things done, finding that balance of getting your message across, getting your needs met, but also respecting, and you've used that, you know, that language as well, respecting the needs of the other being. And I think it's the same thing with our pets. You know, if we think about it, that we are treating them with respect by creating those boundaries, by being consistent, by staying calm, and and everybody's going to be better off in the long run. The other two extremes just set everybody up for failure. Yeah. And it's like, I love my cat. I mean, I treat my cat with, uh, you know, respect and, you know, I can do some training with her and, you know, she wants to be with me and, you know, she's in the room with me like a dog all the time, follows me around, but she's not so emotionally entangled with me. There's still, it's easy to see that wild nature still exists there. You know, there's only so much guidance you can give that you can, it's, it, it does fall more into the realm of typical training. If you're trying to teach her to do something yeah. with dogs, it's different because that emotional entanglement's there. The cat wants to be with me, but when I leave, she doesn't like look out the w- she window. She cry and mourn, and mourn, <laughs> yeah, your, she, mourn your loss. I don't, I don't have to prepare her to learn that it's okay when I leave. She's already like, yeah, don't let the door hit you, lady. But then when I come back, she's all over me, you know? So to me, that's the difference in why I'm saying dogs need this firm but supportive guidance, more similar to children. They don't, they're not children. I don't think they're human children, but they still are a family member that deserves support and guidance and love. Love's already there. It's not like we have that much shortage of love for dogs. It's just that, I don't know, dogs learn things with typical training despite us. And we love them despite the, even the chaotic, you know, and and sometimes dangerous behavior that they have. We still love them. We're failing them by keeping up this dog training, typical dog training mentality. And like I've said, I am very direct about it, right? I've been doing this for 28 years and there's no time. There's no time. I mean, dogs need help. There's no time to beat around the bush about this, right? I was talking to a dog trainer and they saw my book and then they said, you're very aggressive. Your language in the book is very aggressive about dog training. (laughs) I think it's just assertive. (laughs) And I said, no, I said, actually, I disagree. It's not aggressive at all. I don't feel aggressive towards you. I mean, there's some aggression here, but it's not coming from my side, but it's just direct. Mm Mm-hmm. It's direct. Yeah. Why, why even say anything or write anything if it's not going to be real or direct? It, it's not aggressive. It's just real. And so, you know, I'm here for dogs, so I'm not here to get the typical dog training world's approval. Yeah. Well, and I, I will say, I think, and you can tell me if you think I'm wrong on this, but having worked with terrible dog trainers and very well-intentioned and caring dog trainers... I also think that there's probably a certain element, like especially focusing on those who really do care and really do believe in what they're doing, is that if I, as a dog parent, hired a trainer 
and they taught me some techniques that seemed like they were working and then then they weren't working I would probably be more likely to say it's something I'm doing wrong or I haven't been consistent or I'm just a big fat failure or my dog is stupid or my dog's just untrainable. And it's like, I I wonder how many people go back and say, hey, none of that worked. My dog's still doing this. Or do they just kind of hide their heads? And so you don't know what you don't know. It's kind of like in, in rescue, you rescue a dog, you adopt it out or a cat or whatever it might be. And, you know, for many years, I would follow up with every single one. And then after a while, you realize no news is good news, because do you really want to know how it turns out? Because, uh, you know, unless unless they want to give it back, there's not much I can do about it if they already put it to sleep or if they gave it away or whatever. So people don't go out of their way to tell you, oh, I gave that dog away or, oh, I decided I didn't like that dog. So I, you know, had it euthanized or the dog turned out, you know, they don't come back and tell me that. So I would have no way of knowing that. So, right. I mean, it's the shame. It's the shame. Um, No. And I believe also, I agree with you. Many, many dog trainers have their hearts in the right place and they're trying, but it's, but anything that I've never been able to fix and anybody else did something with some dog would say, how'd you do that? What'd you do? What, what'd you do? Like, that's how I've learned all this, right? Is just by pure inching ahead, dragging, you know, finding one piece of information, put it together with another piece of information until I could see the whole picture and I could finally see, but I mean, lucky or unlucky, I've had the, I've had the experience that has been rescue training. Uh, I can, I can train dogs. I can train dogs to do tricks and I can train dogs. I've, they've been on television and print ads. I mean, I can do all that stuff, but that doesn't teach family skills and the things that dogs need in order to stay in their home and to be fulfilled and for there to be happy families. And it doesn't give parents the information they know. What I see the fault in it is shows and books making it appear. They, they water things down and they tend to make things appear like they're more effective than they really are. And then it's, it's entertainment. It's, it's entertainment. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of, you use the term recipes, which is easy, easy to relate to, easy to understand. And it also, I think it makes it less daunting to say there is a recipe. Like it's, you you know, you follow the recipe and you're going to get what you get. You don't follow the recipe, you're going to get something else, which is why my daughter does all the cooking for our household, because (laughs) I am not a good recipe follower. I'm not a good measurer. I don't, you know, it's like, ah, just, you know, eyeball it. But I love the what's not allowed process and the four steps or four, you know, four parts of that recipe because it's it's such a simple but brilliant way to look at and again it's, it's that it's that setting that foundation it's like what are the things that are not allowed and then here is the plan for enforcing those boundaries so could you just give us a quick overview of that yeah so the hardest part has been making it simple so you know that was extremely the hardest part was to make it simple but i know it had to be done and it has to it can't just be simple it also has to work so to make something that works and simple, I've, I, I decided to eventually I just form these recipes to teach skills, um, teach the family rules and teach skills and then prescriptions for fixing fear and aggression and things that parents are going to come up against. You know, it's just true. So and then I have a crate recipe, a potty, perfect potty recipe and for all aspects. So I came up with this what's not allowed recipe because dog after dog, regardless of the problem that it that it came to me with Uh, my parenting was always the same. And so the dog's problems were all different. And so I started honing these tech set of techniques that what, what things actually work on all of them, regardless of their issues. I mean, I've seen, I saw some weird things that I never thought would even exist and just heartbreaking things. And then the fact that I could bring them all the way back and, and find a set of techniques and approaches and perspectives that works with all of them. Then I've said, I have to figure out a way I have to figure out a way then to get this down into a simple recipe or communication form that parents can use. Everybody can rescue folks. So the what's not allowed recipe is so I can touch on it instead of going into the exact details because the two chapters are before that simple chapters, but they have to set the stage and the parental perspective in order to effectively realize why I'm doing, why you're doing this recipe. And it's literally has four steps. So I help parents easily see the guidance moment, right? So you got to see the guidance moment um, and you learn and you see that by you start to learn what the dog is doing or feeling or, you know, lift one front paw, it's unsure, you know, just a set of techniques that's easy to read, not some complicated dog body language chart, right? Just a set of things that you're going to see in your dog. So, oh, this typically happens. I'll see this and seeing, learning to recognize that point early to give early guidance because it's extremely effective, 
then you by empowering them with the recipe, they they're not afraid to go ahead and you know go ahead and start the recipe because they've got they've got this tool in their back pocket. So see the moment that you need to approach the dog, right? And then disagree. I give the what's not allowed guidance, which is ah, ah, we don't do that. You know, there's there's five ways to show that you can do it with your facial expressions, with your um, body language, a little bit of a vocal displacing them, you know, or use a combination or any one of those that works on your dog and how dogs see it. But then the critical part that dog training misses is that once you give this guidance, this what's not allowed guidance long enough. OK, and it usually only takes first time something and, and even in a bad case, it could take one minute, which is only 60 seconds. But then parents usually do it for like four seconds and they go, that didn't work. You know, you hold this guidance, um, keep on, you know, blocking or holding uh, uh, until they look to you. And when the, this this is critical, this eye contact. Right. So then you hold it long enough that they you hold that eye contact then for one one thousand. You don't you don't they don't just glance at you and you hold it uh, uh, one one thousand to to let it sink in because dogs need that moment of guidance to, that that clear guidance to let it sink in. Otherwise, it's just a distraction. Here, go to this, go to this. They're not really learning. This is by the way they learn in nature is to actually uh, uh, to hold that eye contact and then. But here's what you can do, and then you just bring in this full excitement. Here's what you can do in, in this time or this area. Here's what I want you to do, and then you do the action with them, so that you know, oh, this is a great thing. You know, you just overplay this ending part, right? But you're very firm about the other part. Very firm. Uh, uh, that's never going to happen. It's never going to be allowed. And then once you convey this, run through this recipe. If you have to run through it again, you just hold the eye contact just a little bit longer. It's not staring your dog down angrily. You're not pointing at your dog. It's uh, just, I just know that dogs pay attention to that. There's room for, for, you know, adjusting it to your dog's temperament, your dog's breed, age, everything. It, it doesn't just work on puppies and it doesn't just work on older dogs. And it doesn't work on certain breeds. It doesn't work on just males and not females. All that stuff is not something to concentrate on. The breed comes into play with fulfillment, you know, and what they want to do and fulfilling those drives. That comes in fulfillment, but not for guidance. You may have to bring a higher level, but that's just the dog's wiring. Yeah. I mean, I think about it along the same lines as, let's say you've got the fireplace going, right? And you see your kid heading over there and it's like, okay, you already know they're going to be up to no good. Like they, they were, we were over here doing something else. You see the kid heading over there. It's like, would you wait until they stuck their hand in the fireplace or do you realize at a certain point that there is a point where you want to get that attention, you know, and noticing that behavior? Do you want to do it when they're halfway across the room heading there? Maybe not. But once it's once the what's once their intent is fairly obvious, you know, and you get to know that you get to know how your kid operates. And I think it's the same thing with your pet. My Doberman was very dog reactive. You know, when you're going to go out to the park, you're going to run into a dog. And when you see that dog 50 yards away before your dog even sees it without creating anxiety, because you got to be careful about that. But, you know, be prepared to implement the steps. Right, right. And you won't create anxiety. You won't create anxiety when you're emotionally neutral. That's right, because you're prepared for what's getting ready to happen and you have a process in place. Right. And what you what you just talked about, Amy, I'm glad you said that, was because that's a perfect example of early guidance and how much it's so much more effective early on than it. You still have to address it. If you've missed if you've missed the guidance moment, it's already happening. You still have to address it while it's happening. You know, you still have to do something and then make sure everybody's safe and then just make your plan for how you're going to give earlier guidance next time. So. Yes. I mean, people are like, they stand there and watch their dog and they watch their dog. and watch. It's like, if you already see, if a dog already does this and looks right at something, it's like, right then, right? That's early guidance. And it's so effective. It's so effective. You know, it's like, don't wait for them to be aggressive over the other dog. If you already know your dog has that. And then, and they learn so much faster that way. They're like, oh, okay. I'm, that's never going to be allowed. They start realizing when dogs, when you're very consistent, like, you know, just even, even several repetitions of being consistent with something and your attitude is perfectly neutral. Like this is never going to be allowed. I've got, I know what I'm going to do each time you try that. They start believing in, in a dog world, something is always allowed or never allowed. Right. It's when you start mixing those things up for them that that's all that chaotic behavior. And they're like, it, it just seems to come out of nowhere. It's like, it never comes out of nowhere. It, it's either for dogs, you have to completely convince them that they're, it's never going to be allowed. But if you bring frustration and fear to it, they will not, 
be learning that they'll only be learning about what the hell what's going on what are you doing like you know what, what is this about where my paul was now or was is this necessarily about what i was you cannot bring any frustration plus they just kind of just half the time they just either fear you or dismiss you if you bring this anxiety and kind of out of control energy that's yeah they just yeah. dismiss you or or they become fearful of you they don't trust you so but once they trust you and everything and you just keep bringing this with emotional neutral things which is why i put the you know the the human faces in the book, like, you know, go into a mirror and look at this human face. You might not think you're making that face, but you have to make sure that you're, that you're what your emotionally neutral face looks like. And that right there is golden. Like it gives you literally your 50% there when you, <laughs> when you realize that how to keep emotionally neutral, give the guidance. And then the dog pretty soon, it's like, they just realize this is never allowed. So then it's just exactly how, when they get into a routine, and they want to do the same thing at the same time with the same stuff, whatever. You just make them believe this is the routine. This is how we do it. Yeah. And I love giving them that alternative. And, and it, that works with kids too. It's like, you know, you can tell kids no, 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 no. But if you redirect them to doing something else, especially if you're like, hey, let's work on this puzzle or hey, let's make some cookies or come help me stir the, you know, stir the sal salad that I'm making, whatever it is, you know, it's like, it's just, it's engaging. And so it becomes much more enticing and interesting than whatever it was that they were getting ready to go do. Right. I mean, and, and, and when you're giving that parental guidance and providing those alternatives to kids, they can understand a little more gray. They can understand a little more subtle, like, yeah, I mean, sometimes it seems like they're, that was unfair that they were doing that to you, but really, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. All you can do is control your own thing. And so it's better to choose, make this choice instead. You can give them that kind of guidance, you know, as they right. get older too, you can give them more words and more, you know, past and present, you know, guidance dogs. It's always black and white in the moment or they can't learn, right? So those are the main differences in parenting, giving guidance to, to dogs and kids. So they both deserve to have it in the way that they understand, right? And so, um, yeah, what you were saying about the alternative, the a big, big problem with typical dog training is they're like, yeah, we give them the alternative, but the alternative is distraction with a treat, right? So they think they're, they're, they're giving them an alternative. Look to me for that, that stuff, even with a highly food, driven dog wears off fast for most of them. And they don't completely understand. It's an incomplete teaching moment. You know, just to say no is an incomplete teaching moment. You got to provide the yes, but also to do it fast and to say, here's a distraction does not, is not a teaching moment. You know, it, it's just a distraction. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good, good point. Yeah. Good point. So is there a particular whether it's uh, your own personal experience or a pet parent coming back and using these techniques, um, like a success story that you would, you would share that jumps out. I know you've had many, but any in particular that jump out as being memorable. One of the cases I had was um, with a dog uh, named junior, because he's kind of like famous around here and the, everything they went through in the rescues. And um, he'd gone through trainer after trainer and, you know, tear apart crates and could, you know, was end up being put to sleep or being housed in a kennel to be a, a vet's kennel, to be a blood donor for the rest of his life. There was just nothing, no, no trainer. So then they contacted me, but I was very busy with other dogs and I was, you know, doing cases that were just as bad. I could only do so many at a time with my also raising two kids. Yeah. And I, so I couldn't get him. Well, in the meantime, a, a train obedience trainer took him and took him to boot camp for two weeks and said he is that he had gotten rid of his dog aggression and then he could now be adopted. Well, then he went, as soon as he went back, and was in any adoption event or whatever, all the, all the things came back. But, but when he was around that trainer, he was so afraid of that trainer that he didn't attack the trainer's dogs, but he still didn't learn that he couldn't attack any other dogs. It was just fear. Just for, and then I, I couldn't even, by the time I got him, I couldn't use a leash or anything because he was afraid of a raised hand, a leash, everything. So there you got that side of the strict obedience, right? We're going to cure this dog aggression, right? Well, then when I figured out his exact thing was that he was, you know, his anxiety and he was, you know, he had just gotten completely off track and he would just constantly listen for these tiny noises to be like loud noises wouldn't even bother him. I mean, he's just in this loud kennel environment forever. So he's listening for like little, like when the water would go into the ice cube trays in the, in the thing, or the house would creak in the wind a little bit, just like you just freeze. It was all these freezing, freezing, freezing moments. So I undid that, you know, I got that, you know, just said by providing the firm but supportive parenting. Ah, we don't, you know, ah, don't pay attention to that. Don't pay attention to that. Here's what you can do. Don't pay attention to that. Here's what you can do. On and on. Now it's more extreme. Typical parents aren't going to have cases like this. This he was right. unadoptable. This is extreme. So 24 hours constantly. Ah, 
uh -uh, let's do this. No, uh -uh, let's do this. But what had created this initially was all this, all positive, only use treats and distractions. So that had created this aggression. And then that's one side, which created one problem. And then the obedience trader created the other the problem. Opposite extreme, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so within th this, this case took me, it typically took me two weeks to, to fix a dog and get it adoptable. And this, I think he took three or four weeks. It, it was an extreme case, but I point out that and tell his story and you can see video with the digital companion that runs to the book on my website. And I point that out because it shows how neither one of those typical dog training things work and they cause problems, but the firm, but supportive parenting in this book is what cured him. Yeah. I mean, that it requires a level of dedication that I think, you know, it kind of goes back to picking the right dog for yourself or pet, but also knowing, am I ready for a pet? Am I ready to put in this level of work or le level of dedication? Um, you know, it's the same, you know, it's the same with any kind of parenting. Are you ready to be a parent or are you not? Are you ready to do Absolutely. it 24 yeah. seven kind of thing? Do you have the time or the bandwidth to do it? So let's talk about where people can get the, the book and, and just because that was something that I thought was a, a unique feature is that QR code in the book where you can get that because it's, you know, it's, it's really easy to kind of read and skim a book. It's another thing to work through like exercises and a workbook. And I think that's such an advantage to have that companion. Um, so what, first, let's start with where's the best place for people to get the book and we'll put links up in the show notes as yeah. So the best, um, I don't know if you had the, you have the front cover, but the don't train your dog. Um, it's at Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. And our website is parentingfordogs.com with the number four parenting for dogs. And the book has the QR code, as you mentioned in the introduction. And so you can totally learn everything you need to learn in this by reading the book, you know, just with text, but to add a level of understanding or something like, hmm, I'm not quite sure, you know, exactly how I would do that with my dog. Then they can scan this QR code and there's a digital companion that exists at parentingfordogs.com that has, um, and you get free access to that with the book. And then it has the companion videos that show me doing it and show dogs doing these things in real life. They've been recorded over the years of me working with dogs. So you can watch the videos that go with the chapters of the book if you want to. You don't have to. Um, you may want to go back and redo redo them. You can watch that digital companion forever. Anytime that you feel like you want to, oh, let me see that dog body language again when she said, here, you know, the video will stop and it'll say right here, see what he's doing there. You know, it'll yeah. it, it, it'll it gives you a level of understanding that's that's pretty comprehensive. And then also the recipes and the charts or anything that you might want to remind yourself of are there's free downloadables of that. You, you can put them on your refrigerator, hang them on your wall when you're working a recipe. Oh, yeah. That's the four steps that I want to keep focusing on. Yeah. And I think the graphics are so great because to me, especially when if you have older children in your home, it's just as important that they're consistent with these behaviors as well. And they're probably not going to sit down and read the dog book. You know, it's like, but if you had the, you know, the four steps or this is what we're working on this week and, you know, make sure you do this when you go out the back door every time when you go out with Bluey or whatever the case may be. Well, uh, Angie, thank you so much for being on the show today and for sharing your your wisdom, your experience, and just a whole nother way to look at not training our dogs, but, you know, living life with our dogs and living it in a way where it's a quality of life for us and for them. And I think that, you know, on one hand, I think it's very empowering for me as a, as a dog parent or a dog owner or whatever you want to call yourself, but it also is very freeing in a lot of ways because I start thinking about the fact that my dogs, I don't think I have a dog in the house that knows heel. Um, but they walk nicely on a leash. They come in when I tell them to come in from outside. They stop barking when I tell them, you know what I mean? It's like, it's uh, it, they're living life in the way that I need them to live it. And also I think we're meeting their needs for, you know, enrichment and living live, lives the way that dogs should be living lives as opposed to humans. I can't imagine living without it, without that, that, you know, dog family member. And the reason why you have that is because you concentrated on the things that were important for family life, which is don't run out the door in front of trucks or after other dogs. Don't bite kids. You concentrated on teaching those instead of obedience. All right. Tricks. Right. Yeah. Tricks were obedience. Yeah, exactly. Well, like I said, thank you so much for being here. And we'll uh, we'll put the notes, uh, the show notes, we'll have links so that people can get access to the book and all the resources that you have available for them. So we really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on and, and your efforts towards dogs. Thank you. 
Thanks. And to everybody, like I say every week, thank you for listening to another episode of the show. Be sure if you've got anybody in your life that is bringing a dog into their home or is experiencing some issues with their dog, this book will give you a completely different way of looking at how to not only create good relationships, but fix problems along the way. So make sure that you share this far and wide, and we will see you on another episode next week. Thanks for listening to Starlight Pet Talk. Be sure to visit our website at www.starlightpettalk.com for more resources and be sure to follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss a show. If you enjoyed and found value in today's episode, we'd appreciate a rating on Apple. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would be great too. Don't forget to tune in next week and every week for a brand new episode of Starlight Pet Talk. And if you don't do anything else this week, give your pets a big hug from us. Thanks for listening to Starlight Pet Talk. Be sure to visit our website at starlightpettalk.com for more resources and be sure to follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss a show. And hey, if you like this show, text someone right now and say, I've got a podcast recommendation. You need to check this show out and tell them to listen and let you know what they think. Don't forget to tune in next week and every week for a brand new episode of Starlight Pet Talk. And if you don't do anything else this week, Give your pets a big hug from us.